before we start, I would like to say a few words about uh, Dr. Scott Harris, who will give you a lecture today. He's an associate professor of geology and the uh, director of archaeology at the College of Charleston at the US. And he has been teaching uh, college students for uh, more than 20 years. He is primarily a coastal plain and a continental self geologist with expertise in stratigraphy, in sedimentation, in uh, GIS and uh, remote sensing te techniques uh, or in order to understand the evolution of uh, these regions. And uh, he has found himself working uh, in remote uh, high altitude lakes in the lovely areas around uh, Greece. We had the pleasure of having him here last year and this year uh, also and at the highlands of Ethiopia. He has uh, studied geoarchaeology closely in these uh, areas. Uh, he has worked on terrestrial and marine archaeological sites and he has received uh, funding from the US Department of uh, State, from the National uh, Science Foundation, from the Sea Grant, from the US Geological Survey, uh, from uh, NOAA and many other state, local and uh, private agencies. So Scott, welcome and thank you for being here with us today. I know that y'all make really wonderful stuff out there, looking at lots of different um, environments that are very common to that area. Uh, since I'm in a very different part of the world, I thought that I'd present uh, some of the ideas that we have around a wide continental margin. Um, you can see it in this upper photo. And I think, can they see my images currently? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and looking at the geoarchaeology on a passive continental margin and basically looking from the land to the sea. Now, can you see my mouse up here? Yes. Okay, great. So I can point and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so what I want to do is I want to take you through um, sort of the development of the passive margin. Uh, look at large continental shelves. Our continental shelf is 100 to you know 125 kilometers wide. Uh, very different than some of the areas that you've been looking at. Um, it's wide and flat, has a fairly steep edge. It will look at. Um, and the, um, we'll look at some of the primary processes. We're getting ready to have a large impact along our coast, we believe, uh, in the next week from the hurricane. And so we'll even talk a little bit about that, um, how we go about trying to identify uh, the potential of sites. Uh, it's very difficult. It's a very, very large area spread out over a very wide region. And so we'll talk about some of the development of paleogeographic studies and, and how they're conducted, um, and then what to look for on these passive uh, margins. Uh, as you can imagine, we've got a submerged section and an emerged section. The emerged section is a little easier to get to. You don't have to scuba dive or go down in a small sub or use remote vehicles. You just have to deal with alligators and copperheads and rattlesnakes and things. So very different environment um, to the same end. Um, one of the reasons that we try to look um, at the passive margins of the U.S. is that we have a very young population, or at least that's the belief right now, as far as humans inhabiting North America and South America. Um, most archaeologists think the first Americans arrived by boat, and now they're beginning to prove it. And there are two major hypotheses. The one that has a lot of traction right now is the coastal migration hypothesis um, that about 15 to 16,000 years ago, a um, little bit less, a little bit more, uh, depending on the dating and what sites that you really believe. Um, here, if you look over to the left hand side, you'll see all of these different sites that are 14, 13, 12,000 years ago, even 15,000 years ago. Um, on the U.S. East Coast, which shows all of these different types of details, you'll see this Cactus Hill location, um, uh, the Aquila River. Um, there's a topper site that might actually have much older um, archaeological evidence there, even up to 50,000 years. Uh, not a lot of people believe that because the context is a little difficult. But these are all in uh, the different areas. Uh, these tend to be steeper coastal plains over here on the left, the Paisley Caves. This is much more, uh, much uh, more similar to the coastlines you have, except there's this large body of ocean that sends extremely large wave processes going on. There's some little islands and, and uh, little bits down here that are, that are even closer uh, to what I would consider uh, more of a Greek um, system. And so that's kind of nice to be able to have that there. But we're going to talk about this side. 
we're going to talk about a lot of the east coast of the U.S. and um, uh, what that means for our part of the world, but then also um, some of the other parts of the world that have large, wide coastal plains. And I'll show you an image that later. Um, this is where I go to school. This is where I teach. Um, and uh, this is the land side. Uh, this particular building is about three to four meters above sea level right here, not very high. Um, and in this area over here is about minus 30 meters um, to where we're diving there, but down to a minus 50 and then on down to about 200 meters. So how do we do this? And I think y'all have been learning a lot of uh, different methodologies, which is fantastic. I've been sort of watching you as you've gone through your, I forget what day number this is now. Um, uh, but when we look at uh, constructional landscapes, the actual um, uh, terrestrial side, we use LIDAR, um, which is flown from planes, and we actually map the surfaces. Um, uh, bathymetric LIDAR, which is where a plane flies over land or clear water, where it can actually see down 30 to 50 meters, where you're actually using uh, plane-based LIDAR, the light pulses that are actually measuring the depth. And um, in the water, we use multi-beam a lot. Um, our students, we have a large uh, training program for multi-beam bathymetry here. And so our students, they go out on ships and we're constantly mapping um, this area. Um, if we were to map just off of our little state here in South Carolina, if we were to go out in the boat, it would take about two years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just to collect the data, um, just calculating roughly how long it would take. So it's, there's still a lot of area to be um, looked at out there. And we have these competing resources and multi-beam right now is the best way to do it because we are not fortunate enough to have the beautiful clear waters that you do there. Um, ours tend to look like mud. Um, very, I can't wait to get back. We also use coring, probing, um, and all of these are on what we would consider constructional landscapes. We use these, um, we use these methods on areas that have been built up through time. On destructional landscapes and other landscapes that are falling apart and other rivers are cutting into them and things like that or the landscape is just weathering away we use all the same same methods um, but it's not as easy to visualize and so we have a lot of materials that are being poured in together and you've seen a lot of that um, on the coastlines there um, and we rely much more on the subsurface studies trying to find old paleo valleys, trying to reconstruct that paleo, um, that paleo landscape so we can identify all the different features. Um, these are the continental margins of the world. Um, you know, these are the areas where people would consider that we have large continental margins. Um, now, for some reason, NOAA decided to cover in the entire Mediterranean, and we know that's not true. So there are a few of these areas that are a little exaggerated on here. Um, but, you know, this part of the U.S. East Coast and the fringe right around uh, these areas. This just exaggerates it a little bit um, so you can visualize. For our part of the world, right down in this area, this is South Carolina. This is North Carolina right up in here. This is Georgia. Florida's down here. And that big, ugly hurricane is a little bit farther south. And um, here's a little better view. This area goes up to about 200 meters, down to about minus 200, uh, give or take. Um, we call this the fall zone. This is where we have the rocks of the Piedmont outcropping. We have the fall zone, and this is the beginning of the coastal plain. These are all accumulated sediments um, over this 200 and 250 kilometers from here all the way down. Um, we have little specks and remnants up here on the Piedmont. Uh, most people draw the line right down here just below um, where it says fall zone. This is the Sea Island section. This is a coastal plain invade section. There's a lot more sediment up in this part of the world. We don't have as much in here, and we have a little more sediment in here. There's a large river system dumping uh, in this area. And then we get in the Gulf Coastal Plain, which takes us and wraps us around towards uh, Louisiana, Texas, that part of the world. Um, the shelf breakout here, you can see it's a beautiful edge. Um, we have these little peaks and promontories that are sticking out. These are some of the old capes that um, if you've taken coastal processes 
You may have heard of some of those capes. Um, down here in Charleston, we have Kiowa Island. We have something called, um, and I don't remember the name in Greek, uh, drumstick barrier islands, which this is where they were first really um, studied down in this area, the little drumsticks. Um, and they really look like a little chicken leg, a little skinny end and a little fat end on it. Take a bite. Um, we also can subdivide these areas into different ecoregions. And the reason this is important when you start looking particularly underwater and you start dealing with this, these types of surfaces, the different ecoregions are reflected not in the modern, but in ancient times, these ecoregions had shifted during the glacial periods. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well um, before we uh, get to sort of the end results that we're going to discuss today. But these ecoregions have different plant forms, different uh, biological uh, criteria that they're subdivided in. This comes from the Nature Conservancy. They do a lot of work in defining these areas. Um, but we have the Middle Atlantic Coastal Plain and the South Atlantic Coastal Plain sort of divided by this river system. Um, and then the Piedmont and the Blue Ridge. Um, this Blue Ridge up here, this goes up to about 2,000, 2,500 meters, depending on where you are. Um, has a large array of uh, different types of animals, and, and each one of these has a unique uh, ecosystem. So let's go back in time. Let's look at the evolution of the entire coast. We're going to go over the last 542 million years fairly quickly. We'll slow down when we get closer to the modern. Um, are any of y'all familiar with this long-term sea level uh, curve? And I actually can't see y'all, so I don't, um, I don't know that I should see you, but that's okay, I guess. Um, there we go. Um, this long-term sea level curve starts out back here in, in uh, the Cambrian, goes through the Ordovician. We had low sea levels, we had high sea levels, and we had low sea levels. And we're going to really focus in on this end point because this is more important for archaeological details. Um, if we start up in this area um, at the edge of the coastal plain, um, this didn't even exist 500 million years ago. This really exists. Whoop, let's see if I can go back. This started to exist back here in the Triassic when sea levels were low. We had major spreading. The Atlantic opened up, and these rocks were in, in place. Uh, these are granites, and these granites were stuck in there, oh, about 200 million years ago, depending on where you are and what the ages are. The neat thing is this is where we're starting to get the base rock for the area. This is the basement. If we were to drill down about 700 meters below my feet right now, where we're at the edge of the coast, we would run in to these types of rocks. Um, these make the fall zone, just put a kayak in there just so you could see that this is where people go and play, the water's bouncing around the rocks and it's quite nice. This is just up the, um, just up the coast um, inland from here. Um, this is what it looks like when it's dry. This is actually a spillway. And so this is where we bring students to look at the different rocks um, and then these are also supplying the sediments that get to the coast. And so we can look at those sediments, we can look at the mineralogic content, and we can identify different areas based on the rarer minerals that we see, the more rare minerals that we see in the environment. As we move away from that area, go into the, um, go into the coastal plain a little bit, um, these rocks are visible, and these rocks are standing up because they have all sorts of different minerals in them. Um, there's my little dog back there. That's Maggie. And um, there's her bone. And we were looking at this rock. And these are bits and pieces of chert. And these cherts have replaced, as you can tell, these are some of the shells. And so the reasons that a lot of the coastal plain was used, particularly the upper coastal plain um, and along some of the rivers, is that chert gets exposed. This is a pretty bad chert. I don't think anybody would actually make anything out of this because it, it's got a lot more calcite in it than it does chert. Um, but this is the type of stuff that they would use. Um, as we move farther down on the coastal plain, the middle coastal plain, um, you can see there are different sedimentary layers. Um, there's, there's actually cave formation in here and uh, lots of shark's teeth. That's one of our former graduates. She found a little shark's teeth, was very excited about it. 
Um, but again, all of these materials are coming out of the Piedmont. They're washing off the mountains and getting down to the sea. Um, some of these in um, the Eocene period uh, were limestones, and they make caves. These are not the types of caves that you've been looking at. These are not the we don't find um, we don't find a, a large record here. These are not that old. Um, this area is collapsing very rapidly, and we can walk up to this limestone and we can actually scrape most of it out. We do have some hard limestones in the area, but not too much to get this kind of environment. So here's the upper coastal plain. Um, the granites are just off the picture here. Here's the middle coastal plain, and here is the lower coastal plain. And some of the features I want you to recognize, take a look at this image in the lower section down in here. I'm actually located right here right now, and my house is right across the bay. Um, but I'm right there in that section. But look around up here through the the yellows and the reds. What do you see in there? What are the different features? Are they little squares? Are they long and linear? And I think you've probably seen these types of things before. And if you haven't, you will notice this area right here is called Ridgeville. And it's called Ridgeville because it is a beautiful ridge, if you notice. And this is an ancient barrier island. If we go up there and dig a hole, we're going to see cross-bedded sands. We're going to see overwash deposits, some marsh deposits back in the back barrier area. And this is repeated over and over and over again in the coastal plain. Likewise, it's been repeated over and over on the continental shelf. We just can't see it. And for the most part, it's been destroyed. Um, these deposits up here are the maximum of sea level. And so some of these, this area back here, we estimate probably about a million, and, million to a million and a half years old. So um, we don't expect um, to find people a million, million and a half years being in North America. But we do know that it's old enough um, or it's young enough. It's not too young to where we can find all remnants. Um, even down in here, the shoreline down in this area right here, this shoreline's 80,000 years old. So, and we find uh, where people have lived along that 80,000 year old shoreline. As we move down closer, and we'll get to some of those, in the modern system, we see that some of the deposits are being buried. There are ancient shell rings down here that are three to 4,000 years old. Um, some beautiful examples where um, people are still fighting. Are they ritualistic? Or are they just where they threw shells over their shoulder and made these rings? Some of them are immense, and their shell middens um, is another word, but they, they have very specific uh, structures to them. Um, and this is the modern coast. <clears throat> sea level is rising. This event's been going on for 20,000 years. It used to be out towards the shelf edge where we pointed to, and now it's rising up over these little marsh islands. This island right here is about 4,000 years old. So if we looked around, we would find some type of um, probably – um, uh, we would find points, um, hard materials. We do, because of the uh, temperature and humidity here, really the only thing we find is pottery and, um, and points, uh, different types of sherds that we find that are made of stone. Those are really the only two things that survive out here um, that people are finding. So anyway, this is the modern marsh system. I know you all have seen some of those. And then this is the modern shoreline, the modern coast. Here is Folly Beach. Um, there's Charleston Harbor. We're just off to the left in this picture. My house is right over in there. Uh, this is Folly Beach. Um, they're getting ready for the big for a big impact soon. Um, this island, the highest parts are right down in here at about uh, 12 to 15 feet. A few dunes in here are 20 feet tall. Um, but you can see, even though there's some beach ridges in here where the roads are and back up in here where the houses are, the shoreline is eroding. We've got a few uh, groins out here. Um, here is a fishing pier that we can go out onto. And then here are the multiple inlets. This is an ephemeral island that's sitting in a deep inlet. The inlet right here is about um, 15 to 25 meters deep. So we have these deep cuts into the edges of the islands in this part of the world. As you go north in South Carolina, if you go north in the state of South Carolina, 
you get less and less tidal inlets and more broad, long coast. And that's the interplay between the tides and the waves uh, that are interacting with the coast. The bigger the tides and the less the waves, the more inlets you have. Are they familiar with Hayes' model for barrier island development? Sorry? Hey. Eliana? Yeah. Are, are they familiar with um, Hayes' model for the development of barrier islands and coasts? No, you really are you? Are you? No, are they? <laughs> no. I don't know. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, there you are. Yep, yep. <laughs> No, I don't think they are. You have yeah, some of our geologists, but uh, we have also archaeologists here. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> I'll just briefly go through it. This is a good slide to do that with. Okay. Um, and I don't know if I'll, yeah, I probably won't be able to bring up another slide. Um, but uh, anyway, what happens is, and can y'all see me moving my hands a little bit, maybe in the corner? <laughs> yes, a little bit in the corner. I'll be tiny. Um, <laughs> The, um, what happens is when you have a lot of wave energy, the waves actually will wash along the coast. So a lot of wave energy, you get long beaches. When you have less wave energy and more tides, you have a high tidal range, which I know y'all don't there in Greece, but when you get a high tidal range like here in South Carolina, the tide may be up to three meters. Then you start making short drumstick barrier islands. Um, they tend to be short, stumpy, with a little skinny end, a little fat end on it, and that's why they call them drumsticks. Um, and then the inlets tend to be much deeper. Um, so in these areas, we have some inlets that are 25 to 35 meters deep um, as you move south uh, in the Georgia Bight. And because of the shape of the coast, this be the ocean, the concentration of the tides is in this little area and the waves are more prominent up on the ends, the tides are more prominent in the middle, and then down near Cape Canaveral in Florida, you'll notice there are long, straight beaches, Myrtle Beach, there's Grand Strand, long, straight beaches. Here in Charleston and Savannah, Georgia, um, you get these little stumpy barriers. So when you go to other places on the planet, you'll see this type of information. Now, process is acting on the deposits. We have waves at the modern coast. We have currents. These are the regional currents. This was a shot from yesterday. Um, if y'all have not been to earth.nullschool.net down here in the bottom left, you should go take a look at that. That's a pretty cool site. Um, but here you can see the Gulf Stream running up on the edge. And right now the Gulf Stream is cutting into our continental shelf. Um, once you leave the continental shelf, you go from no current and when your ship goes into this stream it's going about a meter to two meters per second depending on uh, the time of year and that is really destroying some of our coastal edge in other words those areas that might have archaeological sites can be destroyed by these types of currents out there <clears throat> winds make the waves and in this image right here you can see that we have winds i didn't bring it up i was afraid i wouldn't be able to um really display maybe i can let me try it i'm just give me just a second eliana i'm going to give this a try because it is really cool to see let me bring it up bear with me for just a second Do you have enough? Is this working for you? Can you see the? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, this is a really, y'all may know about this site. I've just known about it for about a year and it's always exciting when I see it. Um, here you can see the hurricane really, really beating up. It's getting ready to hit Puerto Rico. It's in the U.S. Virgin Islands, getting ready to hit Puerto Rico. But if we move in to this part of the world here, you can see the wind. And these are at the surface. Um, if we wanted to, we could draw, you know, we could look um, at the really high altitude winds. But looking at the surface, um, we can see that these winds today are blowing from the southwest and from the south. And these are driving the movements of sand along the coast. 
during the summer in South Carolina, they tend to go to the north. They tend to move northward. In the winter, when we have all of these low pressure cells sitting off, it reverses and will often get a longshore drift, a longshore current to the south. Oh, and here's another storm over here. That's very exciting. We've got lots of storms out there. One, two, three. Not very good for us. Anyway, so that's that's really neat to see how those winds are operating on a regular basis. And you can go out there any day, and it's up to date. These are just the geo, the geophysical models. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Um, we also have waves that are coming in. A lot of these can be generated from offshore, but you have the wind waves and the storm waves from long distances that interact. And this is the sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, you can see it's very, very hot in these areas. Um, I've already shown you this, but you can see where Monday is September 11th. The storm, this hurricane is expected to be right here over Florida. Miami is right now in, in, down in this part of the world. Here's Cape Canaveral. What I was talking about with the tides, here's Cape Canaveral, very long straight barrier, barrier coast. Here are barrier islands and small segments, the drumstick barriers. And then north again, we have that long skinny strand of beach. Here's what the waves are supposed to be on about Saturday. We're looking at 45 foot waves, 15 meters off the coast of South Carolina. That's, that's way too close for me. Um, we're gonna run away up to Virginia. <laughs> that's where my parents live. Um, so let's get back down to the south, uh, to this area. Notice the scale here has changed drastically. We're down to 10 kilometers. Um, we're right here at this dot. My house is at this dot. But I wanted to show you this image because you can now see a lot of these coastal deposits. Do you see these little barrier beach ridges? Can you see these long strands? Clap or say yes or something so I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I'm just just making sure y'all are still awake over there. I know it's happy hour. We're getting close, and you know I don't want to keep you from that. And this is what the continental shelf looks like. If we go from this, where these landforms are constructed, they still look. We can actually go in there, and we can find inlets. We can find little deltas. We can find all these little pieces. Here is a tidal creek. Here is a better tidal creek. All of these little features are very, very well preserved. When we go offshore, the waves and the winds and all of that material is washed around, of course. And you know this. You, you've seen it. You've seen it in action. Here out on the edge of the continental shelf, we have very, very steep boundaries. If you go out here, this is a little place called Bull Scarp. It goes from 200 meters depth here up to 40 meters of depth, 42 meters of depth. This area and I'll show you on a very quick slideshow, was probably exposed for 50,000 years before it was uh, submerged about uh, 11,000 years ago. So it's a really ancient landscape. These other areas were not so lucky. This one, had a, this one was preserved for a while, and this one was marshes and swamps and everything as sea level rose across it. So we mapped these out. Um, and this, we just did an unclassified or an unsupervised classification and came up with a lot of different types. Um, you know, shelf scar, there's a shelf ridge. If you'll notice, there's a little ridge of rocks here that run along the edge. Those are all about 50 meters water depth. They don't change elevation too much. So we're going to zoom into a couple of different areas right here in this area. And I want you all to take a look at what tell me what you see and we're going to zoom into this area this is called the transect river and this is called bulls uh, bull scar here we have the area what do you see in here there is a large river system if we zoom in you can see the meanders but because of the waves and the tides the area has been scoured it's been ripped apart down here. We can still see bits and pieces, but for the most part, in this 20 meters of water depth, this has been stripped clean. We could not find any uh, peats or any marsh deposits. Um, if we go north a little bit, 
we can find stumps. We can find stumps and, and uh, they're about this big. We can map out an entire forest. But unfortunately, the visibility, we can't get good photos of it. Oh, and if we go back here, you'll see bull scarp. And here, there's a 45 meter depth that drops into 72 here. Um, there's actually a 42 we found up in this area. And it goes down to about 220 meters. Um, if you look in this area, can you see the little ripples? This is where that Gulf Stream is racing across, scouring this area. And we also had icebergs during the ice ages or during the breakdown of the ice. Icebergs actually made it from probably up near Greenland and uh, the Canadian Shield down to this area in the uh, longshore current, um, the coastal current that now stops up near Delaware. Here are the sea levels that we look at. I'm gonna just kind of get through some of these because I know that I don't have that much time and I wanna get on to some other things. Um, here's where we kind of put sea level at the modern, about 125,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, and then we're into the full ice age. And then as sea level rose out of the ice age, it came up to the modern. But you'll notice we're down here minus 125. And um, if we zoom into that area, here we have 125, 180, give or take. We also have these depths. But here is the zero meter at this point. We know that we have 80,000 year deposits along the coast. That's what I pointed out at the modern coast. We know we have these older deposits, and we actually have some 100,000-year-old deposits. At the edge of the continental shelf, we actually have some deltas that we've been able to map, and they show up right at about minus 60 and minus 40 meters, minus 45, minus 60 meters, and then we see sea level rising up. So what that means is here, let's say that humans came into North America, let's take the conservative efforts of about let's say 15,000 years ago, that's going to be right here in this area. So sea level was very, very low at this point. And because of that, let me back up just a little bit. Because of that, if we look here, see the green and the blue? The boundary between the green and the blue is basically where that sea level would have stood about 20,000 years ago. And then it's rising up along this. Now notice to get from minus 125 up to 111 to 90 to 72 and finally up to 45 where you're drowning this is going to take some time, Oh, but it'll make it a very short distance. And so this edge of the coast, I imagine while this was being inundated, and here is the top of Bull Scarp right here. While this was behaving in this way along this steep scar, this is probably very much or very similar to a lot of the areas that you see in the Mediterranean. Um, and unfortunately for us, we have that large current that's really destroying the edge of Bull Scar. So the idea that we can find anything on this edge is probably very, very low. And so trying to recreate this paleogeography and look at these areas, you have to understand the processes and you have to understand what's going on. Now, on top of it, that's a whole different story. Remember, it's been exposed since it was uh, last uncovered here about 75,000 years ago. Here are some of the images. This is a sub-bottom profiler image. Um, if you can see it, the ship was up here. This is the seafloor, and these are the sediments beneath the seafloor. Here's 100 meters, very, very large scale. Um, but we can see that there are about 20 to 30 meters of cross-bedded sands that make up the edge of the continental shelf here. And here we are coming into the more recent. 18,000 years ago, sea level really started to rise. Um, we have the Cactus Hill deposits, which are up in Virginia on land. The Topper deposits, which are um, down in South Carolina on the land. And here we have Clovis. Uh, some of you may have heard of Clovis before. Uh, the archaeologists probably have. Um, but the Clovis, it was originally considered some of the first people that moved into North America. That was Clovis first was the big 
paradigm. And for people to say that there was anything before it, it was blasphemy. Um, and they got yelled off the stage, uh, blah, blah, blah. But as you know from the work in Crete by some of the folks there, um, that you can actually find ancient peoples that were there long before we thought. And so that's one of the reasons that we study the continental shelf out here and that we're trying to identify these older populations. Um, at this point um, here, about 11,000 years ago, we breached the shelf edge. At the same time, we probably had these rivers that were forming on the coast. Um, about 4,000 years ago, we see these shell rings. And here you can see that beautiful shell ring. Here's part of one, here's another part. And these are um, basically this um, late archaic in our phraseology about 4,000 years ago. Um, you can see the different points and the different materials here. There are people who have been finding materials on the shelf. <coughs> Dennis Stanford from the Smithsonian, they have found some points that really look like Salutrian um, uh, in, in Europe. Um, so there's, there's a lot of probability or possibility that we do have older deposits. We just haven't looked in the right spot or dug deep enough yet. Um, here's modern sea level rise. We're looking at about 3.24 millimeters per year, just to throw that in for you. Um, and here's that transition again. Um, here, you'll see some construction material. Because our beaches are washing away, we like to pump a lot of sand up there. And that's why the sand looks so muddy. Um, and actually the water was very beautiful, but it was still yucky <laughs> uh, in there. Um, in order to map these areas, we do a lot of different work here. Um, this is up in the Myrtle Beach area. Um, we're trying to merge the idea of the coastal plain. These are the um, greens and yellows and reds. Uh, these are the different elevations here. And then we get down to the modern coast in this area. And if you look offshore, these are, this is a side scan sonar mosaic. And the little green lines that you see there are where we took the ship back and forth and back and forth. U.S. Geological Survey did a lot of that. Um, the yellow lines on here are ground penetrating radar. Um, and so we tow it all over the place, trying to get an idea of the construction of this landscape so we can understand how it was built and what these features look like. Are they the actual original surface or have they been uh, broken down a little bit through time? Offshore, we definitely know that there's been a lot of change and a lot of dynamics <coughs> in the area. And so we put together geological maps of those sites. So um, we try to merge these data sets. Um, we have problems with it. Uh, where were the shorelines? And we try to apply, um, you know, when we had glaciers sitting up in the north, it depresses the crust, okay? And then we get a bulge in front of that. And so all of these movings and changes uh, in the mantle and in the upper crust actually influence where shorelines were. And um, in this, I brought this image back just so you can see, there was a lot of ice sitting over. You can see the little blue line here. That boundary is where ice was sitting over the North American continent. And that caused this area with three kilometers of ice on it to be pushed down. That created a bulge. And then this bulge decayed all the way down into the Caribbean. Um, so we're actually lowering a little bit faster here in South Carolina because that bulge is still falling down. Um, it's called the glacial four, uh, glacial four bulge. Um, so you might see that. So what I did is I applied the glacial four bulge models um, of Peltier and um, Simon Engelhardt to the actual coastal bathymetry and topography to reconstruct the landscape at different times based on real elevations so we could see when water crossed over the edge. I'm going to take you through what ends up being a slideshow video of quite a few shorelines that we can see. So let's take a look at that first one. Um, you might notice we're actually, I'm actually right here. This is Charleston. Here is that bull scarp. North Carolina, uh, Virginia, Washington, D.C. is right up here. And here are the mountains. 
The color scale is about the same. You're going to see the sea level rise. This means the shoreline. Um, this was 26,000 years ago. You'll notice that the water is still up on the edge of the shelf here. This is where the water still is. Um, if we go to, um, oh, there's the modern coast. I thought I'd put that in there. But um, So there's the modern coast. 26,000 years ago, it looked like this. 25,000 years ago, sea level was still falling up in this part of the world. It was right on the edge of the coast here, 24, 23. And if you keep looking up there, you'll see it disappearing. 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16,000 years ago. Now notice what's happening down in this area at this time. We're starting to get little tiny changes. They're almost imperceptible at this point. 14,500 years ago, and there's the timer there. 14,000, where we get the shelf breach. Very, very exciting stuff right there. Did you catch it? We go back, there's 15, 14, 5, and 14. 13, 5, 13, we have the shelf breach again up in this area. And you can see the green, and the green slightly represents where marshes and swamps could have been. Although this is such a gentle slope, we had swamps all up in here. We know that we had swamps all through where the freshwater river systems. The green here represents more of the estuarine or saltwater systems. 11,500. Notice that this point right here is still sticking out into the ocean. Now we're starting to get a broad expanse of estuaries about 11,000 years ago. This is when Clovis showed up. And we finally start drowning full scarp between 11 and 10.5, okay? And so now we race the shoreline every 500 years. You'll notice how quickly it's moving now because it's going across that gentle slope. Now we're getting into the time period where the data really aren't working too much, except up here in the Chesapeake Bay, where this large, now large estuary, the river was just being backed up. And the nice thing is with this model that we developed, it matches the timing by other researchers that say that the Chesapeake Bay started becoming uh, partially saline about 7,000 years ago. So it's nice that that works out. It's good when science works. Um, and in the southeast, about 6,000 years ago, the modern shorelines are basically right here. Now, because of the bathymetry, we see these long points. They probably did not exist. These are artifacts. The waves would have long since removed them, even though they're still large capes today. 5,000, 4, and then the modern. After 4,000, it's really hard to even begin. But this is what the whole modern coast looks like. Here's the Chesapeake Bay. Oh, there's DC right up in there. Um, and the entire coast. I wanna show you some of the cross sections. So we're gonna actually take a look at some of these areas. Here's Washington, DC again. <clears throat> a, B, C, D, E, all the way down. And I want you to take a look up here. This is Onslow Bay and C at this location. <clears throat> And we can see it about, oh, let's see, I'm, I've got your, your stuff's covered up for me. There we go. Right here at about 10,000 is when that shoreline was fully breached, okay? In the Myrtle Beach, South Carolina area, D over here, we see it was right about the same time, but not, not as much. This actually breached more significantly. And if we continue to look, um, we notice Charleston right down in here, the shelf break lasted um, only until about 11,000 years ago. So it breached a little bit earlier. Um, so some of the you know interesting aspects of looking at these models is that we can really come up with um, different ways that the shoreline migrates across the edge. And for the archaeologist, the edge of the continent might be a very obvious point. And I think after y'all studies from the last couple of weeks, recognize that 
there's a large wealth of uh, resources at the edge of the continent. Um, you've got the rivers dumping out. Um, quarries make you more interesting inland, um, unless you're working along the edge here. Here, we believe that there are good chert outcrops just based on the geology of the region. And so we think that there were large quarries possible out in this area for chert uh, location. But resources. Um, in the Ice Age, when it was cold, we probably um, had, and we have some evidence that there were seals and walry and, and large marine mammals. We also know that oysters were very prominent throughout the extent of the continental shelf. Um, oysters are a little uh, bivalve that we have. I, I forget the Greek word um, for oysters. Feel free to say that out, Eliana. <clears throat> and um, so about 12,000 years ago, we had that in the 11, we had the broad expansion of estuaries. So I just want to go through that again really quickly. Um, and the positions on the shelf again, maybe plus or minus 10,000 years. And we'll take a look at this area. This is right where we live. Um, here you can see this little beach. We have an 80,000 year old shoreline. And we have an 8,000 year old shoreline. This one's about 3,000. And that's the beach maybe six to 8,000 years ago. This, is, this has a little bit of a range that we haven't been able to nail down yet. This one is two or 3,000 years. So you can imagine as sea level is rising, we can only find, you know, deposits of where people are because this was such an active coast that are only two to three thousand years old here. But this shoreline here, dated with optically stimulated luminescence, is going to give us really good age estimates. There's a double line. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong thing there. So, yeah, there we go. And so here are some other age estimates. Um, Charleston, again, is right over here to the right. My house is right in there. Um, here's that large inlet that I showed you. And these are some of the dates that we've been getting. <clears throat> a thousand years, 1.5, 6,000 to 8,000. This is the one that we've been kind of worried about. Um, this is three to five. This is 80. This is that island I just showed you. This island right here is this island. The plane was flying right over in this section looking to the right in the image. 80, 110, 125, so these are really, really old. But here we have um, roughly 3,000 on this shore face. This one's 45, this one's 3,000, telling us there's probably an old inlet in here that reworked this section. Um, understanding how these areas get reworked and change becomes very problematic. Uh, because you can see all of the cuts and fills. But here, just north of the harbor, that's south of the Charleston Harbor. Here's north. We see all of these different ages again. Here's 500 years. Here's 1,200 years, um, 80,000, um, 125,000, 200,000 back here on this ancient ridge here. So where do we go? We're going to try... Um, to continue doing offshore paleo landscapes, uh, work with BOEM uh, and wind partners. We're going to attempt to more efficiently map the outer continental shelf. We're working with people that on the outer continental shelf, the water is very clear. Um, I've been scuba diving and 75 feet, and you can see wrecks on the bottom. So we know that 25 meters, we have a pretty good probability of being able to map it. It's just convincing uh, some of the uh, high dollar people that that needs to be done. Um, we're trying to uh, currently, well, we have a lot of people working between the coastal plain and continental shelf and bridging those areas, trying to use alternative geophysical techniques, um, a lot of magnetometry and rare earth element mapping, that kind of thing, um, and finishing up a large coastal plain map that we can then use um, to test some of the offshore areas. So I'm going to stop there. I think I've talked way too long. Um, and if anybody has questions, maybe uh, Eliana can, um, oh, come and, you know, give an idea, uh, maybe show her face so I can see people. I'm having a hard time because I can't see your happy faces or if anybody's head has hit the desk and fallen asleep yet. No, 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 no. no. Everybody's awake. Oh, good. Oh, there you are. I will turn the screen to show the, to, to look at the students.
and okay. you, they can ask uh, questions freely, I think. Okay, thank wait, you. Wait, wait, wait. barely see you on the little tiny screen. Um, let's see. Well, let me get, let me, well, I'll leave this picture up because it might be helpful if you have questions. Um, oh, there's some people over to the left as well. Hi there. So do you have any questions? Hmm? So with all this data, how do we recognize the best place to find the archaeological places? Scott, do you hear or do you need to get close? Uh, if, if you can repeat, that would be awesome. I'll come closer. So, after you have all this work done, how do you select the best places to find archaeological places? Ah, uh, okay. No, thank you. Um, so, you know, when we look at the modern landscape, thank you for the question. Um, when you look at the modern landscape, such as here on the left and the greens and the yellows, we take that model of a landscape. Um, we know what the rivers look like. Um, the rivers have evolved over the millennia, and we try to take that information out on the continental shelf, um, looking for those rivers, looking for those landscapes that have not yet been buried by the water. And of course, taking those landscapes, understanding where the people were, and then mapping out here on the shelf and identifying those similar landscapes. Now. One of the problems we didn't discuss, because that's another three-hour conversation, I'll go very briefly, is right now on the coastal plain, we have meandering rivers. You know, meandering rivers go back and forth like an S-shape, just like the transect uh, river that we saw there. That's a tidal creek, we believe. But the larger river systems um, during the inundation of the continental shelf, they may have been braided rivers at that at some point. And we know David Lee's work, um, David Lee has been doing a lot of work in the coastal plain. A lot of these areas, like you see the wide green area up here, can you see that? This area currently has a meandering river channel, but in the past it had a wide braided river channel Basically, this whole area was more, um, more, uh, a lot less rainfall, uh, more desert, and so we had a braided system. The rain came in pulses, uh, probably because of uh, different streams of water, almost like a monsoon that um, that's prevalent there, um, and so we get these braided systems, and those were what were probably crossing the continental shelf. Those rework in the modern coastal system very nicely, so it's hard to find them. We really are trying to look, and particularly in that minus 20 meter area, we see a lot of channelization that probably occurred when sea level rose. We had the wide embayments, and so we had a lot of tidal exchange between the back barrier and the coastal system that set in those areas. So we try to identify the ancient um, river bottoms, um, those are often what are preserved. Look for those estuaries and then map out the hillocks around them. And we're starting to go in. We just had a crew diving out there uh, two weeks ago. Um, we were able to see some of the landscape. They didn't find any artifacts, um, but that really wasn't the purpose. It was really to get down there and identify some of the landscape features. And so looking in those areas and bringing out the landscape features similar to what we see on the, uh, on the coastal plain, we try to uh, bring that forward on the continental shelf. Does that make sense? Did that help? Thank you. You can just bring a chair up if you like. Yeah, this will be easier. I. For what I understood, I read articles relating to archaeological finds in the Chesapeake Bay. Yes, Darren Lowry's work probably. Uh, can you explain why this area has been preserved and found? Because I understood there is a very shallow line of marine sand and there is a estuary clay under it, no? 
Yes, and he's found it in those coastal deposits. And I, let's see, I'm trying to think of a good place to, let me, give me just a second and go back a few, because there, oh, there we go. So he's been looking along, I believe it's this section right up here. Yes. And these areas that he's finding these artifacts are basically, if you look at, whoops, sorry, if you look at this image, um, this was 9,000 years ago, well before uh, the time, or well after the time where these um, artifacts were left behind. These are ancient Pleistocene terraces, and I think these are the ones you're talking about, yeah. that the modern coast is now getting up to the edge of them. So these are eroding, but these are ancient. These are 80,000-year-old terraces um, that are now being uh, drowned by the modern coast. And so um, he's able to walk along the shoreline there, um, and he's only looking up a meter, meter and a half above the modern sea level, and he's able to look at these deposits where the... Um, uh, the tools were left at the surface, and that surface has been slightly modified. Um, there have been some Eolian sands, um, some Eolian sand deposits um, that have been laid down on top of them. They've worked their way down a little bit into the other horizons, I believe. Um, and so that's why he can find them there. They're, they happen to be near the modern coast, but had he gone there 10,000 years ago, you know, he'd have been looking in the forest, and, and it would have been very difficult to find them. Now, the salt water has killed off the vegetation, and he's got a nice escarpment that he can look at where the modern coast is cutting into these um, much older deposits. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. No, you're welcome. No, it's a, and I'm, one of these days, I'll get up there, maybe during the hurricane evacuation, because I'm, I'm probably headed to right here for the evacuation, so... You know, it's not too far. <laughs> um, one more question uh, about Corin. I, I know it's highly used, in, especially in Florida, in the Audilla River area. They use a lot of Corin to try to detect this place. Can you tell me a few words about what they're looking for exactly in these Corins to try to detect the archaeological places? Yeah, so I'm um, looking at, I guess that's uh, Michael Fout and his team. Um, they've been looking in those areas for quite some time. And uh, remember the um, sub-bottom profiler uh, data that I showed you. Often it's very easy to go out and collect these data. Um, you know, that's what we've been doing there with uh, Nikki and uh, gang over the last couple of years. And once you find an ancient channel that appears to be filled with the appropriate material, mud, we hope, um, some type of marsh deposit, the coring is used to date those, and that gives you a position of sea level. Now, in the coring, you not only want to do radiocarbon dating, but you also look at some of the microfossils, and those microfossils can give you a really good indication whether it was fresh water, whether it was brackish water, or whether it was salt water. And so looking and trying to identify the level of the ocean uh, in those areas is really, really important. Um, and so that's what they've been doing in those in those places. They have a really good um, entrenched river system that they've been able to identify, and we have not been so fortunate on our coast. Um, off of Georgia, off of this area, we have some. And on this outer coast, I mean, I can point out to areas here in about 50 meters of water depth, which is a little more difficult to dive in. I don't dive that deep. There are only a few people um, scientific divers that I'm aware of um, that I know well that dive that deep and um, it gets a little bit more difficult to go down there um, it's also the waves over here can get really you know on a normal day it's really difficult doing work out here when you go off of Florida it's a lot smoother so they have a little better working condition as well thank you you're welcome other questions? You can ask another one if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking is in the coding they have been detected anthropogenic signals more than used lithids or charcoal because I am aware of one word due by an Italian name but I don't remember his last name. I cannot pronounce it basically. 
Um, was it Tornquist? No. No, 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 no. That's he's not Italian. Didiano. Um, but the, yes, and I'm not familiar with that work. I'm not very familiar with that work. Um, uh, but yeah, you can find certain traces on some of those surfaces. So if you're, you know, from some of the cores, trying to identify these anthropogenic layers, um, you know, I almost, I, I think of it as similarly, you know, the, the end of the Cretaceous meteorite impact, where they look through these layers of iridium. When people have lived in an area, you get other elements, and I don't know what they are. You, uh, you probably know that better than I do, um, because I'm mainly a geologist, just to be clear, um, that we can look at those surfaces and we can identify different peaks um, within them of different materials that indicate human occupation. Um, but you can do that in a core very easily. Um, I mean, it's... It, it makes it very easy to have a nice layered core because then you can go through millimeter by millimeter, extract the materials you need, and pull that information out. Thank you. I don't have more.